Hey. Hello. We're back. We're back. Um, now we're back. We are, and we're back. <laughs> it's like, um, Jimmy Fallon as a, uh-huh. the, I think like the Access Hollywood guy. <laughs> and uh-huh. we're back. <laughs> yeah. <It's> a, <laughs> such an obscure reference. Um, anyway. I love it. That's what we're all about here. Yeah. Obscure pop culture references. Speaking of references, I feel like Edna from The Incredibles in these these glasses, and I'm a fan. I see that. I, like I see that. <laughs> you are. You are Edna from The Incredibles. Yeah. That's who you are. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, I strive to be. I am none of them. I'm Boo from Monsters, Inc. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh. Uh, yes. Still talking about Wrinkle in Time. Uh, this is our last Wrinkle in Time episode mm-hmm. because uh, next next weekend, no, oh, the next weekend from the one that this episode will be released is a major holiday in much mm-hmm. of the world. Mm-hmm. So we're gonna we're gonna not release an episode on that day. We're gonna take some time. We're gonna take some time. Take time to realize. I don't. I don't know that the Colby song. Calais sang the song. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> yep. If I just realize, realize what I just, what just realize, realize. I, like, oh wow, okay, she's she's but coming to Christmas lots of realizations. Is next week. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is, yeah, and you know, like we know, not everybody celebrates Christmas, but we figured it was a good time to take a break. Yeah. Take a break. Take a break. Let's go <laughs> for the summer. Let's go upstate. Go upstate. Okay. That's enough. That's enough singing. No more. We no have to get through this episode with no more singing because we used oh, up no. our quota. We oh, used no. up our quota. <laughs> Shoot. Okay. Well, um, Aaron, what did, what did we talk about last time? <laughs> so last time on the Pop DNAs, we <laughs> talked about... Um, kind of the elements of the world of Wrinkle in Time and used those elements to determine what the genre even is for this here piece of, um, piece of fiction. And what is the genre? We still don't know. (laughs) We still don't know. It's kind of up to you. We still don't know what genre it is. Yeah. Um, Um, that's, yeah. yeah, that's cool. Um, that's cool 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 <laughs> that's cool. Cool. cool 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 uh yeah yeah and I think it's still you know uh hopefully uh you gave us you gave us your ideas listeners and viewers mm-hmm. what what genre you think Wrinkle in Time is um yeah we don't have those answers because we're recording this five minutes later but yes. <laughs> yes. but uh yeah maybe we can Add some of those to Instagram or something. Do yeah. some shout out shout outs if you yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Uh yes, this week. It's our last wrinkle in time episode. <sighs> it's been a it's been a great ride. Um yeah. And I let's think, get into it. Yeah, this week specifically, we're talking about why it's important to keep in mind who this is for and uh-huh. who this was intended for and why that's important, right? Like the author right. decided that this was a story she was going to tell in the sphere of like yeah, a young child's fiction, right? She did not write this story for like specifically for an adult audience. She kept it for children and that's really Mm -hmm. important to the piece um yeah so when I I don't know about you well maybe I do because we mentioned it but (laughs) when I was reading this this was the you know you know everything about me (laughs) Erin aww (laughs) and you the same I don't anyway um and to me, the same also. <laughs> also. What was that? That was from something. Um, Probably. I don't know. Yeah. And to you also. The, yeah. Anyway. The um, same to me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
yeah um oh and to you the self same good wishes oh my gosh that's from something oh um, but that is from something and to that? you is the self same um, good when, wishes is that win a date with tad hamilton yes is that what it's yes, yes that's what it is <laughs> I love uh, when when she is talking to Tad Hamilton. Uh huh. And to you, the self same good wishes. Same good wishes. Oh, oh I love that. That's one of I uh, love that movie. Anyway, um, another obscure pop culture reference brought to yeah. you by Pop DNA. <laughs> brought to you by Pop DNA. Um. <laughs> so this was the most terrified I'd ever been when I read this in third grade. This was like so scary. Um, and it's really important that it was scary. Like that was very purposeful. Um, and it just led me to think about this divide we have between children's books that allow for children to be scared and children's books that sugarcoat everything and don't really want to let children go there. Um, and my staunch belief that it is important for children to access scary media, um, to a degree, like maybe not watching like the clown it, maybe, maybe we don't need to do that, but I do think it's <laughs> interesting. Like it's really Saw important. for kids. I remember how we, we had like ni <laughs> knives out kids and Clue <laughs> Jr. <laughs> right. Right, right, right. Um, <laughs> so perhaps not those pieces, but I do think it's important <laughs> um, for children to access danger and fear in in media. And I'll tell you why. So please do, um, Miss Master's degree in child oh development. Oh, oh dear. Um, <laughs> so. As a whole, I believe that children can handle much more than we give them credit for. And yeah, so I have a few thoughts on kind of this conversation about like, how far do we let children go and how much do we give children in terms of like scary media? So, oh, I just jumped. Uh, where'd it go? Oops. Oops. Um, so as we give children media, it's in many ways a, a place for them to grapple with the things that are happening to them in real life. We've talked about this, I think, with the Hunger Games and with a few yeah. other. Um, media is a safe vacuum for children to think about things that are already happening in their lives, things they've mm -hmm. already encountered or things that they will encounter later in life. Um, and that is the central reason why it's important to give children these themes of loss and these themes of danger um, that they're given in Wrinkle in Time. So in many ways, A Wrinkle in Time really replicates exactly what happens as we encounter these more adult themes of loss and of fear and of kind of trying circumstances. Um, so Meg, Charles Wallace and Calvin go on this adventure throughout the universe and they're not ready for it in mm -hmm. the same way that we're not ready as children to access adult themes, but we, they still happen. They mm -hmm. like we're, and a lot of people think children don't see those things or don't hear those those concepts but they very much do. like children are are really smart you guys mm -hmm. <laughs> they're they're intelligent people um we see this in the book as it's a very like as even though uriel is very much a um perfected world it's still a little bit scary that they've met these three kind of magical beings and gone into a you know the universe in a different way than they've ever experienced so it's very much daunting and scary but it's also magical um but then there's a moment where the three mrs w's are no longer able um to tesser with them and they say sorry like we um, we can no longer do this. We have to go. And the children have to figure it out on their own. Um, 
it, you know, in a, in a lot of ways, it reminds me of that scene in Bambi where, <laughs> um, where he experiences that loss and like becomes an adult as a result. That's what mm-hmm. happens to all of us as we become adults is there's always that moment of, oh, oh, I'm no longer really protected anymore. I'm no mm-hmm. longer, um, I'm no longer a little egg. I am very much in the world and making my own splashes and doing my own, making my own actions. Um, and we see this even as um, Meg has to go and find her father. Like she mm-hmm. has to save him and the roles reverse. Um, right. We see that in a whole lot of places in uh, Wrinkle in Time. And I think that's, a lot of the point of this book is talking about giving children the ability to think about um, these moments they're already accessing. I think by 10 and 11, we're already kind of taking on those responsibilities. Yes. Or we're starting to think about it and we're starting to observe the adults in our life taking on those responsibilities with yeah. like, you know, with um, kind of still with like a child's perspective, but we're starting to kind of realize psychologically that there's other perspectives outside of ours. Right. At at, around that age. So, yeah. And it's why like in early childhood education, you have children resolve disputes by themselves and you step in if anyone's like really causing anyone else pain, but it's really important to give those lessons in a safe space of a classroom mm-hmm. or of a children's book of figuring out how you're going to be in the world. And I think that's something that A Wrinkle in Time really does really well. Um, for me, it was A Wrinkle in Time and Ella Enchanted that really gave yes. me my first like oh, life can be really scary. And I got to think about that before it was for me, but a Mm -hmm. lot of children experience trauma and they need a place for, to grapple with these things and kind of resolve those things in their, in their minds. Um, which I think is what's most important about any of this. Um, so the children get abandoned by the Mrs. W's. We see this in the change that we get in Charles Wallace when he's taken over by the IT. Yeah. Loss of innocence um, that we see with Charles Wallace, we really see that um, as he gets taken over by IT and he gets really mean for the first time. He's no Mm -hmm. longer like this sweet, smart kid. He's kind of conforming to how the bullies are on earth. Um, All of these are ways that um, Langell really thinks about the evil of conformity and the evil of um, losing that innocence and kind of it starts to become that the villain of the piece is like not considering your child like innocence as you're an adult, you know? So it's really important, I think, so that children don't lose that um, childlike quality to give them these um, narratives that allow them to consider danger and how they're going to, how they're going to react to that kind of thing in the world around them. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Um, There was a really interesting study done as well um, about the importance of danger on the playground. So kind Mm -hmm. of in the same way that novels are a safe space for children to grapple with these things, um, like cognitively, Mm -hmm. the playground is the place for them to grapple with danger in the physical space. So what am I capable of and what am I not capable of? I can go on monkey bars and swings and down the slide because I know what my body is is capable of. Um, Mm -hmm. Children have to learn how to be in the world. And that's why we write these arguably too scary narratives for them because (laughs) they're gonna like as an adult you're gonna go through things right as a child you're gonna go through things and you yeah um 
And I loved the list you had here of yeah, some books. I just um, So these are all, um, so a few of these are books that I sort of discovered um, a couple years ago when I was trying to write a middle grade novel and that it didn't, maybe I still will, we'll see. But yeah. um, I was reading, I was reading a lot of middle grade novels about um, like how they, you know, how they handle um, scary and dark themes um, for children and how they, yeah. you know, how they're exploring that through a child's perspective. Um, and some really, really great ones that I came across um, were the Small Spaces series by Catherine Arden, which um, I think currently there are three books and there's a fourth one coming soon, I think. Yeah. Um, this actually, the first Small Spaces book actually reminded me, uh, um, the main character reminds me a little bit of Meg from A Wrinkle in Time. Um, yeah. It's very, very much that kind of like misfit feeling like, yeah. you know, not quite fitting in, uh, not quite comfortable in your own skin. Um, and then another really good one is A Monster Calls by Patrick Ness, which I believe was adapted into a movie uh -huh. at some point, if it's the same one that I'm thinking of. Um, cool. And then some other like slightly older, um, but still 21st century um, books, um, Coraline and The Graveyard Book, both by Neil yeah. Gaiman. Terrifying. Right. Uh, um, but really, really interesting explorations of these dark, scary ideas. Yeah. Um, and then also a series of unfortunate events. Yeah. By Lemony Snicket, um, which also the, the Netflix TV series based on, on the books is also a very good. And then we also have The Giver Quartet by Lois Lowry. Um, yeah. I think The Giver in particular um, gives us an interesting view of a society that appears to be utopian but again, is dystopian. So there's that, another good one to read alongside with um, A Wrinkle in Time's exploration of Camazots. Yeah. Um, and then I also um, don't feel like a discussion of A Wrinkle in Time and its place within children's fiction would be complete without talking about the Chronicles of Narnia. Um, right. Because they were, so the Chronicles of Narnia were all like, in, like they were all, all seven of them were released like in the 1950s, I think, like before yeah. 1960. Um, and then we have A Wrinkle in Time in 1962. And, um, and Lewis and Lingle actually have like, there's a lot of similarities between them that you can kind of draw out, like they both definitely have like religion and religious mm -hmm. themes being like foundational to their stories. Um, and then they also both have this pattern of, you know, at the end of the book, the children return to the ordinary world and they're now tasked with navigating their, you know, going back to their old life and navigating the world with this new knowledge and this new perspective that they've gained from yeah. this fantastical adventure. And I think that that idea has kind of become foundational to children's fiction and children's fantasy. Um, we see it in so much, um, you know, of the, of the works that, that have come after. Um, and yeah. even like, like, I mean, it started with like Alice in Wonderland is kind right. of within that same vein. Um, and I think that it's like, you know, as we were kind of discussing um, with the ideas of like danger and kind of this, this age, like middle grade is for children ages like eight to 12, I believe, eight to mm -hmm. like 12, 13, maybe even 14. Um, but like that age is when you're really starting to explore 
your place within the world and and you're first starting to conceptualize the idea of like one's self like yeah. one's identity and one's um uh like how you conceive or how you perceive of yourself um and so the fantastical adventure in these stories we can kind of read as a metaphor for children's awakening into adult ways of thinking um, yeah. as as you kind of alluded to earlier um it's like saying goodbye to childhood and then moving into adolescence or young adulthood um so really like I think I think you mentioned this before as well like these stories are a way for children to explore and process like these fears and these desires and emotions and psychological ideas that they're currently like just starting to deal with just starting to grapple yeah. with but they don't understand it yet um, right and so these stories with these kind of fantastical mm -hmm. adventures and these um you know, fairy tales kind of function the same way for much younger children, that it gives them this, um, this world, this story that's detached from the reality that they know, but it offers them a way to process what they're feeling and what they're yeah. experiencing um, in, in a really, you know, kind of visceral, emotional way. Yeah. And then deal with whatever it is they're dealing with in the real world yeah. after having processed that through this story. Um, so yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, I, I, I uh, hard agree, agree with you <laughs> there. Um, <laughs> I, I think it also, just as an ending note, I think it also pairs self-efficacy with magic in a way right. that's really cool like right. look at all that you can be in the world you know you mm -hmm. can be a superhero you can be magical in your um your pursuits of the things you love um yeah yeah yes and i think that something that the 2018 a wrinkle in time adaptation captured really well is keeping that childlike perspective on the story, yeah. um, you know, I think that it, um, it got kind of mixed reviews mm -hmm. from critics. Um, you know, I think the things that were kind of praised the most were it, um, the direction, Ava DuVernay's direction and Storm Reed, which we haven't talked about her at all yet. And she does an amazing job she's so she's phenomenal. wonderful uh she's so perfect um and her performance is praised a lot um but a lot yeah. of reviews according to uh this kind of aggregate review summary <laughs> um found, uh, a lot of them found issue with the film's heavy use of cgi and numerous plot holes which i don't know what they're <laughs> what plot holes what are you talking about um i just they're fantasy worlds what do you mean there's too yeah. much cgi okay yeah and like how okay. would you have done this without using cgi i don't know um yes so let's look at like i wanted to look at like kind of the breakdown of like how these reviews actually like where they actually fall um mm -hmm. So on Rotten Tomatoes, it has an approval rating of 42% based on 336 reviews. But the way that wow. Rotten Tomatoes works um, is kind of like the aggregate score is kind of misleading because they're saying that they're not saying that the movie got a 42% score. They're saying that 42% uh -huh. of the reviews were positive or generally oh. positive um okay and it, it has an average rating of 5.3 out of 10 which is above average mm -hmm. so um and then uh rotten tomatoes critical consensus says a wrinkle in time is visually gorgeous big-hearted and occasionally quite moving unfortunately it's also wildly ambitious to a fault and often less than the sum of its classic parts um 
Metacritic, which I think is sometimes a better metric for, you know, for measuring how people actually feel about a movie. Um, right. So on Metacritic, it has a weighted average score of 53 out of 100. So that matches with Rotten Tomatoes average score, um, indicating mixed or average reviews. Um, Cinema score um, gives it that based on based on um, critic and user um, scores gives it an average grade of B um, that uses an A plus to F scale. Okay. Um, and then post track, which I haven't looked into this one very much, but this seems like an interesting way of doing because they they broke it down by audience. Um, by audience age. Um, oh. And so they note that audience members under the age of 18 gave A Wrinkle in Time an average grade of A minus and a positive score of 89%. So 89% of the audience members under the age of 18 gave it a positive score, yeah. liked it. So I think that's where we kind of need to focus yeah. Because like under 18, like that's who it's made for. So yeah. it matters if they like it, right? Um, yeah. I think um, one review that I personally agree with quite a bit, though not 100%, um, but it kind of sums up kind of how I felt when I first watched the movie um, is the one from the New York Times, mm -hmm. um, which says, I would describe the overall experience as satisfaction rather than awe. A Wrinkle in Time, faithful to the affirmative democratic intelligence of the book, is also committed to serving its most loyal and susceptible audience. This is unapologetically a children's movie by turns yeah. gentle, thrilling, and didactic, but missing the extra dimension of terror and wonder that would have transcended the genre. Thankfully, though, Ms. DuVernay has dispensed with the winking and cutesiness that are Hollywood's <laughs> preferred ways of pandering and condescending to grown-ups. Yes. Yes. I'm, yeah. I'm kind of tired of that. Um, yeah. Shrek, I'm looking at you. Um, the, be <laughs> the best way to appreciate what she has done, this is what I agree with the most. The best way to appreciate what she has done is in the company of a curious and eager 10 year old, or yeah. if you're really lucky to locate that innocent, skeptical, open-hearted version of yourself. Yeah. It's like, yes, like abs I didn't, I didn't see this movie with a 10 year old. Um, but I think in many ways I am emotionally like a 10 year old. So I, <laughs> um, and I think like for, you know, for people who read the book as a child, I think it was easier for me to kind of get into the mindset that I was in as a child when I first read the book. Yeah. Um, so I think that that does help a little bit. Um, but I also think that kind of like the crux of these reviews that are like decrying the use of CGI, like, like we said, like how else are you going to make this movie without using CGI? Tell me how. Um, or really any of the stylistic elements, like those kind of like direct, direction directorial or like style choices like if you're critiquing those you're kind of missing the point of the movie i think mm -hmm. um i uh and i think that this also kind of speaks to um a, a systemic problem within hollywood and within the movie reviewing industry not just in the movie industry but like in movie reviews yeah. um so this is something that um uh, brie larson talked about when she gave a speech during um the it was in 2018 in the women in film um awards in los angeles um you can find her speech on youtube we can link it um so she cited the um or she referenced like the critical reception of a wrinkle in time to kind of illustrate this issue that she's talking about um she um cites this data from usc's annenberg inclusion initiative um, which in 2017 found that only 2.5 percent of top critics were women of color 
while 80% of film critics who reviewed the year's top box office movies were male. Um, and yeah. to uh, kind of highlight her point, she talked about how critics received a wrinkle in time. Um, this is yeah. quoting direct, directly from her speech. She says, our industry has gone through a major growth. We are expanding to make films that better reflect the people that buy movie tickets. But they are not allowed, by they, she means um, movie, movie critics, movie reviewers, um, are not allowed enough chances to read public discourse on these films by the people that these films were made for. I don't need a 40-year-old white dude to tell me what didn't work about A Wrinkle in Time. It yeah. wasn't made for him. I want to know what it meant to women of color, biracial women, to teen women of color, to teens that are biracial, I yeah. want to know what my work means to the world, not a narrow view. And I think that's such, like, you, you should watch her be, do the speech because she, you know, does it better. She's an Oscar winning actress. So, you know, um, <laughs> but I think that that, like, that she's really highlighting what the real problem is here because like yeah the negative reviews are not the point like that's not the no. real issue like everyone's going to have different tastes and different opinions on movies like yeah that's the nature of art that's the nature of yeah the criticism of art um but the point is that you know for the most part we're only hearing critiques from one specific demographic of society. Yeah. It's not representative of the entire population. And so in general, we're not hearing it, as Larson calls it, public discourse from people whose opinions matter and are more closely tied to the films, specifically with A Wrinkle in Time, but in general with films that are made by and for women, people of color, people of other marginalized identities, like we're not yeah. hearing from the perspectives of those people, what they thought of those movies. Right. Um, right. And that's a problem. Um, Huge problem. Yeah. Um, so yeah, definitely. Cause like in her speech, she also kind of breaks down a solution to like how, yeah. it, you know, we like the industry could be more inclusive. Um, yeah. And yeah. So go watch her speech. Uh, we'll link it. Um, but yeah, I also just really love Brie Larson and I think she's yeah. a fantastic human. <laughs> yeah, she's wonderful. Yeah. And um, <laughs> yeah. Just the internet yeah. as a whole, anyway. sometimes there's just this like stunningly negative. <laughs> like just enjoy a thing. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, that's that's kind of what Meg learns in A Wrinkle in Time, right? So, yeah. Anyway, that's what we're all learning all the time. Yes. Um, we took a quiz. We did, and my AirPods are done now. So uh -oh. I'm going to take them out. Um, maybe okay. one is still working. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can still hear you in one, and I'll charge them, and then I'll charge one half. Okay. Yes, we took a quiz. Who are you on Excellent. the quiz? Um, I was the dad. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Dr. Alex Murray. I feel like this is a pretty accurate description of me. Like, I'm not a, I'm not a physicist, but, uh. <laughs> no, but you're a smart human. That's true. <laughs> like, I disagree with you. Oh, yeah. Of course. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> but who are you? I was Mrs. What's It. Ooh. Yes. As a preschool yeah. teacher, I feel yes. <laughs> I see it. That is accurate. I yeah. see it. Yeah. I think we all aspire to be Mrs. What's it? Uh huh. I think that's that's the goal. That's the dream. That's the um, goal. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, wrinkle in time. It, it's hard to call this like. I don't think I'll ever be done thinking about mm -mm. this, this series, you know, it's, no. it's hard. I still have, uh, the book that I, I bought from a used bookstore when I was, I think I must've been like, I must've been like 10 or 11 when I bought this, but I'd already read the book. 
but um, I just wanted to show everyone who's watching on YouTube that it has this little Scooby-Doo name tag it has in a it. Sco <laughs> just the Scooby-Doo, it's, it's your name, it's saying yeah. that it's your name. It says, oh. this book belongs to, yeah. Rhonda. Aw. Uh -huh. Yeah. Scooby-Doo. Anyway, um, that's what was popular when I yeah. read this book. Um, zoinks, Scoob. Zoinks. Yeah. Anyway, uh, what are we going to talk about next month? Is there a devil involved? And is also Prada. And involved? Prada. And, <laughs> and Sammy like Tucci. And like an 800 page book that I read and actually it, really liked. Oh, is it 800 pages? I didn't think it was It's that long. long. It it's is pretty long. long. Yeah. 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 We're going to talk about uh, Devil Wears Prada. Devil Wears Prada. Woo. And I think that'll yeah. be fun. Yeah. Less of like a <laughs> heavy conversation for us. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, we'll find a way. We'll find a way. Yes. To make it heavy. Um, but yeah. Uh, yeah. I guess as we wrap up here, uh, Merry Christmas if you celebrate. Merry, yes. Uh, happy other holidays if there's any other holidays that you celebrate right now. Um, or if I there's not. We happen to be recording on the first day of Hanukkah. So that's, Hanukkah. Yes, that's true. It will have long passed by the time this yes. episode's released, but that's okay. Happy belated Hanukkah. Yes. Um, Kwanzaa will be coming up mm -hmm. pretty soon as well. So yeah, um, just happy time of year. Happy December. As and always, please take care of each other. Please do. And have a lovely new year yes yeah yes all right <laughs> goodbye friends goodbye <laughs>